Fiber is a super big cause of confusion. It's so mind blowing. Like, is it going to mess up your keto diet? Is it not? Do you need it? Should you abstain from it? Does it kick you out of that ketogenic state? Does it drive your blood sugar up? Oh man, it, it, seriously, it makes my brain hurt even thinking about it. So let's put some clarity to this, okay? Let's go ahead and look at all fibers and a potential strategy that you can use to get more out of the keto diet with less potential risk for getting kicked out via fiber. You're tuned into the internet's leading performance, nutrition, and fat loss channel with new videos every single Tuesday, Friday, and Sunday at 7 a.m. Pacific time. I ask that you please hit that subscribe button so you never miss a video, but also please, please, please hit that bell button. Okay, that bell button is gonna bring up a little drop down so you can select to turn on notifications. That way you know whenever I go live or whenever I post a new video, which is almost every single day these days. Anyhow, let's go ahead and let's get into some fiber signs. All right, so we have to understand, first of all, like what fiber is in the big picture and why we can't digest it. And although this sounds like super embryonic and very juvenile in terms of explanation, it makes a lot of sense and it's important for the rest of this video. We simply can't digest most plant fibers because they contain something known as cellulose, okay? Cellulose is what makes up like the physical cell wall, the physical wall, like what gives a plant structure, okay? The fact is, as humans, we lack what is called the cellulase enzyme. The cellulase enzyme is what is needed to break down cellulose into what are called beta-glucose, but also polysaccharides. So we're talking about like short-chain polysaccharides that we can actually use for fuel. Without the cellulase enzyme, we basically just have cellulose remaining intact, going through our digestive system and pushing out waste, okay? I.e. fiber, i.e. roughage. Here's what's interesting though. Bacteria has the ability to break down cellulose, okay? Some fungus has the ability to break down cellulose. Some animals even do. The reality is humans just lack the enzyme. So fiber is not always fiber. Like some organisms, it's actually food. Now, I'm gonna leave one thought for you to noodle on for a little bit, and I'll come back to it at the end of this video, okay? We have bacteria in our gut. Does that mean that if fiber stays in our gut long enough, if cellulose stays in our gut long enough, that eventually the bacteria can break it down and create beta-glucose and create those short-chain polysaccharides? So could fiber actually raise our blood sugar if it's in our gut long enough? I don't know, we'll touch on that in just a second. But before I go in any further talking about soluble fiber, insoluble fiber, the best kind of fibers for you, let me first say like, you really don't need to be worried about fiber too much on a ketogenic diet. Like an avocado has 12 to 14 grams of carbs. Okay, if you have a tablespoon of chia or even just like one ounce of chia, you're looking like 10 grams of soluble fiber. A uh, tablespoon of flax, it's like three, four grams of fiber. Okay, then a cup of asparagus, you're looking again, three to four grams of fiber. Okay, so you're getting a good amount of fiber through the aggregate, like you really are throughout the course of the day. And some scientists actually believe that we really don't need fiber at all, that if we have a healthy gut biome, everything should just move. And if we have proper gut motility, we shouldn't have to rely on fiber. We should have an inherent ability to just move food through. So that's interesting food for thought. Now, I'm still a believer that fiber is powerful, and a lot of it comes down to the fact that it's just very satiating. It makes it so you don't really wanna eat, which I think is great. Okay, now let's break down the two key types of fiber and then we'll go a little bit deeper into a strategy. We got soluble fiber. Okay, soluble fiber is the type of fiber that actually draws water in. Okay, it's got an osmotic effect. It's not like the traditional cellulose where cellulose is just roughage and pushes things through. Soluble fiber draws water in. Okay, so this is a hypothetical example, but it's an analogy. Like one gram of soluble fiber might draw in 10 grams of water. Okay, so it's gonna create this big gel-like substance that therefore acts as roughage and pushes things through, okay? But it also is gonna slow down the absorption of fats because the gel sort of envelops the fats. It's gonna do the same thing with carbohydrates. So if you slip up on your carbohydrates a little bit on a keto diet, that gel-like substance can actually kind of envelop and eat them up so they don't end up absorbing through the mucosal layer and end up through your intestinal tract and raising your blood sugar. And then it just pushes them through. Pretty powerful stuff. It also can remove the unesterized cholesterol. So cholesterol that would normally get absorbed and potentially drive cholesterol levels up depending on the person. But anyway, it can help gobble that up, move it on through. Then we have insoluble fiber. Okay, insoluble fiber is the traditional vegetable fiber. Okay, the roughage, like lettuce, you know, things like that. Things that are... Insoluble fiber is not soluble. It doesn't draw water in. It's purely what you see is what you get. One gram of fiber that is in an insoluble form is one gram of fiber, okay? There's no osmotic effect. It doesn't draw water. You get what you get. You eat 10 grams of fiber, you got 10 grams of mechanical push through, okay? So here's the interesting thing. I don't understand why people don't look at insoluble fiber and soluble fiber 
through different lenses because it's very, very important that we do. In my honest opinion, and this is somewhat of a hypothesis, if we consume soluble fiber, we're going to get more bang for the buck with less potential risk of kicking us out of keto. Let's pretend for a second that fiber could kick us out of keto because some people will argue with me, but the fact is that some people, including myself, see somewhat of a rise in blood sugar when they have fiber. Okay, so let's just put that on the table for a second. If that is somewhat of a viable concern, well, then insoluble fiber would be a lot easier to kick us out of keto than soluble fiber would. Why? Because we could get away with having one gram of soluble fiber and it draws in a bunch of water to create a bigger glob of fiber with one potential risk factor. Whereas with insoluble fiber, we have to consume 10 grams of insoluble fiber to get the same mechanical amount, to get that same physical structure. So now we have 10 units of potential risk. Okay, so we've really got a situation there that could be a problem. Okay, there's one particular fiber that's really intriguing to me that I've done a lot of research on, and that's the world of glucomannan fiber. Okay, glucomannan fiber comes from the root of the cognac plant. So you've probably heard of like cognac pasta before, or maybe you've heard of like miracle pastas and things like that. Okay, the interesting thing about glucomannan fiber is that it is so soluble that it literally holds 50 times its weight in water. So if you were to have one gram of soluble fiber from glucomannan fiber or glucomannan pasta or something like that, you're literally gonna hold 50 grams of water with it. That's a lot of roughage, okay? Now, the interesting thing is there are studies that have shown that glucomannan fiber reduces your ghrelin levels. There's an interesting study that was published in the Diabetes Research Clinical Practice Journal that found that when you consumed glucomannan fiber, it enhanced prandial ghrelin production. So basically, it made it so that if you were to consume this fiber before eating, it would make it so that you weren't that hungry when you were eating. So you have the glucomannan fiber at the beginning of the meal, ghrelin levels just suppressed, so you had no desire to really eat. Now the interesting thing is they found that four hours later there was a reduced level of ghrelin increase. So normally ghrelin levels come back up, make you hungry, and wham, bam, thank you ma'am, you're done, okay, you're hungry again. But in this particular case they found that just having that little bit of fiber before they ate ended up making it so that the ghrelin levels really didn't come back up. They were slower and more steady, meaning just that little bit of fiber made you less hungry later on. So obviously this makes it a lot easier to eat your fiber on a keto diet and not get freaked out that you're A, gonna get kicked out of keto, but B, going to overeat, okay? Now, if you wanna get your hands on some glucomannan fiber, I'm good friends with the guys over at New Pasta, so I want you to check them out. I put a special link for uh, their product down in the description below. They're really the pioneers of the cognac plant and really, really have taken this pasta to a new level. So they've got that glucomannan fiber totally worked out for you and they've got it in some delicious pasta. So literally you're talking like 25 calories in like a whole plate of this stuff and a ton of fiber. So if you're having an issue with fiber and you're not a big vegetable eater, you still like pasta, I highly recommend that you check them out because they've done it in a way where it's completely unadulterated and actually good, clean, close to the earth and truly gonna help out your keto style. So anyway, big shout out to them. Make sure you check them out. Okay, so now I wanna jump back to this whole insoluble fiber thing. Okay, the whole insoluble fiber thing that I was talking about where like if bacteria can break down the fiber, the cellulose, then we could potentially have sugars, right? So that's a concern for me. And I've always wondered, just personally, when I have fiber, like from a vegetable source, a lot of times I do notice that my blood sugar goes up or sometimes my ketone levels come down. And if you have poor gut motility or even not, we could potentially argue that the bacteria that's in our gut, because we have trillions of it, is digesting that cellulose for us later on in the game, causing a small, okay, not big, but possibly a small increase in our blood sugar. And if we're eating a lot of fiber, this could become an issue. So I'm not anti-insoluble fiber, but I do think that if you get more of your fiber from things like chia, flax, other insoluble forms, you might be a little bit happier. Now, psyllium is another good route to go to, like just good old-fashioned Metamucil. Now, the issue I have with chia, the issue I have with flax, is of course gonna be the omega-6 profile. So you don't wanna overdo it on that. That's exactly where the glucomannan fiber comes in. You're kinda of net neutral in the world of fats. You're not having omega-3s, you're not having omega-6s, you're having pure fiber. So if you're going for chia or flax just for fiber sake, then eh, you're also getting the negative implication of the omega-6s. So that's why the glucomannan fiber is a result there. If you want the fats from the chia and the flax, I understand. Anyway, I'm digressing, whole different ball game. The point is, put your thinking cap on. Fiber is not 
everything that it's made out to be. Okay, there's different situations in which fiber does different things within your body, and we all have different gut bacteria, and we all have different bioindividuality, and we have different responses. So take the safe route and do what's gonna work for you and your digestive system so you don't get constipated or the opposite. As always, keep it locked in here on my channel, and I'll see you in the next video.